Our last speaker of this se session is Jack Raymond from D-Wave, and he's going to be telling us about quantum and classical estimators for quantum Boltzmann statistics. Okay, um, thanks to the organizers. Uh, this is the fifth D-Wave talk, so I'm sure after this talk's finished, this is the last one no one will speak of D-Wave again for the rest of the conference. So, um, what I'm going to talk about is the fact that we believe D-Wave can be used to sample quantum Boltzmann distributions. Uh, we propose these two tools, which have always, already been talked about. One is this idea of quenching. Oh, sorry, one of them has been talked about. That is quenching. The other one is called post-processing, which I'll try to justify. And uh, you can also use two other tools, which we've evaluated extensively, parallel tampering and simulated quantum annealing, to sample these distributions. But they take a lot of work, so we can compare it against D-Wave. So the quantum Boltzmann distribution is just a quantum system in a heat bath. So it equilibrates at a certain temperature, which is T. And T is not a, a free parameter in this uh, evaluation I'm going to show. It's 12.8 millikelvin, which is what the physicists tell me it is in uh, the D-Wave machine. And um, yeah, Z is uh, the partition function, which you get by taking the trace of this exponent. And uh, Z sort of contains all the information about the, the quantum Boltzmann distribution. So why bother with quantum Boltzmann distributions? Well, one reason is uh, quantum material simulations. So there are lots of systems like magnets that we're interested how they behave in heat baths. Um, there's quantum Boltzmann machine learning, which is this uh, new idea that maybe we can represent probability distributions that are more powerful in the context of of quantum Boltzmann machines rather than uh, just Boltzmann machines. Um, we want to maybe use thermal effects to improve quantum annealing outcomes. So there may be ways to excite during the annealing process. And uh, if there's thermal effects, you want to understand equilibrium. Um, and finally, yeah, the D-wave seems to be stuck at some low temperature. So how is our own device behaving? Uh, and so what does inference mean in the context of quantum Boltzmann machines? So like you basically one of the tasks you may be interested in is estimating marginal statistics, like the probability that a state is plus one relative to minus one. And so the expectation of sigma i z is just a trace of the sigma i z operator with respect to this Boltzmann distribution. Uh, I suppose normalized as well. And specifically, I'm going to talk about stochastic icing Hamiltonians. Um, so it takes this form, which everyone else has shown. Um, an important point is that there exists a classical model with the same equilibrium properties as this quantum Boltzmann distribution. And you can create that classical graphical model using Suzuki Trotter formulation. Okay. In the Suzuki Trotter formulation, the states are world lines, um, which, for example, Mohammed showed these loops. The idea is these world lines are loops. Um, and you do sampling of those loops uh, with a Markov chain Monte Carlo process. And the one I'm particularly interested in is called continuous time quantum Monte Carlo. It's the same as path integral Monte Carlo. It's just a particular way of doing it. OK, so I'm going to talk about three sampling methods only. So the first sampling method we call PTQMC. So it's this method parallel tempering, which Itai Hen talked about, for example, and, and several other people, even uh, even the last talk, uh, talked about. So this is a very powerful method. We can apply it to this classical model. Okay, And we're using CTQMC dynamics. Uh, the second method is simulated quantum annealing. So this is just quantum annealing of this classical model. So again, we're using CTQMC dynamics. And these two methods are ergodic Markov chain Monte Carlo methods. So basically, if we use these methods to estimate these statistics, they're consistent. If we run it for a long time, we get the correct result. Okay. And the third option is to use D-Wave. So D-Wave came after the guarantee step. So why would we use D-Wave? We have these two methods with guarantees. So what guarantees do we have for D-Wave, and why would we bother to use it? Um, so the answer is, hopefully, D-Wave is faster generating these samples, and they're representative of quantum distributions. 
So the D-Wave machine normally works by, you give it your classical Hamiltonian, uh, consistent with the chimera graph. You put it through this annealing schedule, and you get one classical output. So if we want to represent quantum Boltzmann distributions, there are several problems. One is that it anneals to the end, uh, and at the end, it's a classical distribution. So where's the quantum part? Okay, but also may maybe uh, it maintains some quantum features, but we have no control over what part of the schedule is, is taking the quantum features from. So basically we have a solution for this, which is Quench, which was mentioned by Trevor Lanting and also used by Richard Harris. Um, the second problem is output's always classical. So how do we find out quantum parts, quantum elements in the distribution? And I'll suggest we post process. And also there are analog errors and there are quench errors and post-process can also help with these as well. So the quench feature is basically that we take the annealing schedule and if we're interested at a particular point, I think so here would be 0 0.5, we, uh, we anneal in a regular way to that point. Uh, we hope there's some equilibration, maybe globally, maybe locally, and then we ramp out. So we prevent the dynamics late in the anneal from happening by going faster than those dynamics. And uh, hopefully we get properties of this ramped distribution. Ideally, it acts like a pro uh, projection. So we're gonna get a classical state out uh, so we can know the classical statistics of, uh, of the quantum Boltzmann distribution. But actually, lots happens during the quench and in particular things like problem energy decrease. Okay, so we have this other idea called uh, post-processing which uh, we thought of it originally in the context of uh, this sort of temperature estimation uh, work, which is this citation. Some people thought I'd talk about temperature estimation, but I'm not. Temperature is just a fixed parameter in this presentation. So um, basically what's gonna happen is during the quench, you have an equilibrium distribution. We can represent that by wave functions, or we can represent it by a distribution over these world lines. So in the context of world lines, what would happen is the world lines get quenched, so they sort of decrease, the quantum element disappears, uh, the loop collapses onto a single state, okay? And that tends to be a low energy state. And the post-processing idea is that we can basically take um, the CTQMC process and start with this classical state, and, uh, sorry, this should obviously be S0. We can uh, post-process it through some steps back into a quantum state, or a loop, uh, uh, sorry, a world line. Okay, so if we start with this world line, we quench it out, becomes a classical thing, and we uh, relax it back. Um, we can do the same, like we have a distribution between the modes. After we relax back, we get the same distribution between the modes, and we've sort of recovered the original statistics that we wanted. Okay, not all uh, world lines can be reconstructed. If you have like a world line that's maybe spanning two modes, it cannot reestablish that uh, spanning behavior because it cannot cross this barrier, okay? So it's good for local reconstruction, but you can't necessarily reconstruct all global states. And that may be an issue near the mobility edge, but actually we're not seeing it. In, uh, in a lot of cases, we're not seeing it, probably because these uh, states spanning the two modes don't contribute very much to the measure or the statistics we're studying. Okay, so I'm looking at a particular synthetic benchmark, which is a uh, chimera structured spin glass. Um, this, is not, this is not an ideal benchmark, and uh, that's been said before, but it is good in the sense that it has a lot of degrees of freedom, and it's easy to define, and uh, we, we make some modifications to address the other issues. So basically, in, in this model, you have, in a chimera graph, you have uh, two types of couplers topologically distinct. One is between the cells, one is within the cells. Okay, so we basically set these uh, random IID. Okay, but we're gonna tweak the intercells relative to the uh, intracells. Uh, we make them a bit stronger. And this uh, is to counter the effect of clustering, which is one of the main problems with chimera spin glasses. Um, the case of alpha equals one was studied by Helmut Katzgraber and he showed there was no spin glass transition. There's also no spin glass transition when alpha is three. But you do sort of uh, make these problems a bit harder for methods like intercluster moves and uh, also for other tailored methods like HFS by sending alpha equal to three. 
um, and where we're going to look because we also need to decide what, what AS and what BS we set. So we're sort of not interested in this early region because uh, CTQMC is very fast here, so there's no need to use a quantum annealer in that part. Uh, and we're not interested in the very late part because uh, we know there's no dynamics there, but also that those models will be very close to classical distributions. So we work in this region of interest where we're, we're, we have slow dynamics for CTQMC, uh, for parallel tempering and for simulated quantum annealing. Um, we're quite far from this region where it's easy. We're also quite far from this region where mean field works and high temperature expansions and stuff work. Uh, we also want to be quite far from this frozen region where we have no dynamics. Also quite far from things like the uniform distribution over ground states. Okay, and the final parameter is temperature, which comes from physical measurements, as does the, as does the schedule. Um, so normally you see A and B measured in gigahertz, but um, we're only interested in the dimensionless version of this. Okay, so we have this target Boltzmann distribution, and uh, it's uniquely identified by these dimensionless parameters, all the couplers and uh, the transverse field. And uh, if you think about this as a maximum entropy model, it's also uniquely identified by the expectations of the correlations and the expectation of the transverse field. Um, so for that reason, because it's a sufficient statistic, we're very interested in the error on the correlation. So this is going to be our benchmark for how well we're equilibrating. Um, but there are other statistics of interest as well. And you may ask why we haven't looked at this. Uh, well, we have, but I don't have time to show it in this presentation. But also statistics, uh, the correlation specifically, need to be known for things like quantum Boltzmann machine learning. So the, the results will relate to this. Um, so the first estimator is called PTQMC. In PTQMC, you're interested in model one, but as well as modeling uh, one, you're going to model another set of four models, where five is a fast mixing model. So you model all these things simultaneously, and they exchange information, and then you initialize randomly. After some time, you start collecting samples in, uh, in model one, and from this you can, you can create an estimator just by evaluating the statistics on those samples. So with this method, we believe we can obtain very accurate statistics for these quantum Boltzmann distributions. And uh, this is for four by four chimerographs. So what you see in uh, these estimators is there's this like waterfall phenomenon, and then it falls into this asymptotic regime where you have fair samples. And uh, so we're able to drive down errors very small. And uh, SQA and D-Wave are parameterized by this rate and uh, time, so a couple of minutes. Um, basically, we evolve it forward and we ramp at this point. Then we do this post-processing steps to reestablish the uh, quantum statistics. And uh, we do this 1,000 times. And uh, I'll just show some, we, we wanted to see if D-Wave is good for anything, basically. Um, because these other two methods are very good. So what, what we did finally was we um, chose as a target a maximum absolute error from the D-Wave machine at, say, a given rate. And we can ask how long in sweeps does the PT QMC estimator take, and uh, what rate does SQA need to be run at to achieve the same error. Okay, and we're going to just show some results as a function of S and uh, the scale of the problem. So this was the first result that I was sort of very excited about. So um, PTQMC was like pre-tuned with these models and so forth, and we uh, we ask how long it takes to get the same error that's coming out of D-Wave. And uh, for larger S, which are sort of the harder, more multimodal problems, it seems to be taking longer, and it it's also tends to be going up with system size. It's true not only in the median, it's true in the quartiles. And um, then uh, we also suggested to us, we also look at uh, quantum annealing. And that does, again, for these harder problems at, at large S, there does seem to be some growth. So I'm sure there'll be questions about this. So I'll just conclude. I mean, I, I should say, like, we have some explanations for, for why these trends exist. But it's still a lot of work. 
Okay, so all, all three of these things can be used as estimators. We can work with projected or quenched samples. And uh, PTQMC is very fast for small systems and small s, but um, it gets a bit slower for bigger systems relative to D-Wave. And uh, this is a work in progress. Okay, thank you. Great, we have time for uh, one or two questions. There's something I've been confused uh, since the beginning of the conference about sampling Boseman distribution with um, the D-Wave. So in general, when you are um, doing annealing, and then you have an easing glass, right? And then you do quenching, and then you have this frozen behavior. So in general, the system um, does not thermalize to a Gibbs state, but what they call a generalized Gibbs state, because you have a very large number of conserved quantities. So, I mean, the distribution of this, this, the steady state is not a thermal one. So I don't understand how you have, I mean, you sample Boltzmann statistic. So, so you're saying that if it thermalizes, it's not a Boltzmann distribution? No, it goes to a steady state. It's a little bit like integrable systems. The difference is that you don't have an infinite number of conserved quantities, but you have a very large number of conserved quantities. And then your steady state is not a thermal state anymore. I mean, uh, yeah, I'm, you'd have to explain to me afterwards because I'm not familiar with it. I mean, one is the, uh, it's the energy, and then there are others. I mean, Dynamics is glassy. You're not equilibrating. I mean, that's a, um, yeah. There's lots of there's lots of evidence we're not equilibrating. I mean, this this comparison is a comparison of out of equilibrium distributions, to an extent, because we ran D wave with fixed resources, so it doesn't achieve zero error. Yeah, so you're not sampling from the Gibbs distribution, right? No. Nope. No. Um, I mean, SQA, so a lot of people have said, for example, SQA can, uh, well, SQA could, for example, uh, model the dynamics of D-Wave. This would be true of QMC dynamics were like physical dynamics. And you see that as you increase the annealed time, the SQA error is driven to zero in this system. So you can equilibrate with SQA, for example, um, if you run for long enough. And in the D-Wave case, actually, we, within the experimentally accessible run times, we didn't see it quite reach zero. We do see it consistently go down, which is consistent with equilibration. Okay, we're a few minutes past 5.30, so uh, let's thank Jack again and all the speakers in this session.